This instructional video is designed to discuss the idea of the moments of inertia of a molecule. If you're doing microwave spectroscopy and you have something other than a diatomic molecule, which is most of them, then you need to know something about the distribution of mass uh, as it relates to the three axes in three-dimensional space. And knowing that can then give you deeper insight into what kind of results you might expect. So in order to do that, we're going to use the benzene molecule. Now, that means that we'll need three axes that are mutually perpendicular in three-dimensional space. So you have to do a little bit of imagining. And I'm going to be using colored markers to help draw some of that out. So the idea is that my claim is benzene is an oblate top, which means two of the moments of inertia will be identical, and the unique moment of inertia will be larger than the other two. So the first axis that we want to draw is when it's going to come in and out of the board. So we'll use the green one and kind of diagonal. Imagine that's going back and the other one's coming out the front. And so in this case, your moment of inertia is the mass times the square of the distance from that axis of rotation. So since the axis of rotation is in the middle, every carbon-hydrogen pair is the same distance from it. Uh, in fact, it's going to be one bond length away. And therefore, we know that we're going to have six times uh, that quantity for each one of them. So for our green axis, we'll call that in out. Uh, we expect to get six times the moment of inertia, which is going to be the mass of our pair, carbon hydrogen, and uh, one bond length. So, so the claim then is that we need two other axes to worry about. So I'm going to take the uh, blue marker and we'll use that for the horizontal. So, and that means that it cuts it exactly in half. And then I'll take the red and use that for our vertical axis. E E R T. And that also cuts it in half. So my original claim that this is an oblate top means that this has to be bigger than these two, but these two have to also be equal to each other. And so for that, we'll need to use a little bit of imagination in terms of how we're going to use symmetry to solve this, as well as taking advantage of some trigonometry uh, based on the fact that we understand the bond angles in our sp2 hybridization scheme. So first is our horizontal. So if this is the horizontal axis, I'll draw it here so we have enough space to see things. Then the rest of the molecule, everything is off the axis. But this cuts this bond in half, CH, CH, CH. And so we already know that both of these are one half of a bond length away uh, from this axis of rotation. And now we just need to figure this one out. So if I cut this in half, this is 60 degrees. And the line to the center here is also going to be 60, which means that this has to be 60. Since all the angles are equal, it's a regular equilateral triangle. So that means that this is one bond length, and so are both of these distances. So I now know that up top and on bottom, I'm going to have two of these that will be that mass, and it's uh, one bond, and that's squared. And then here, this is a half of a bond. So I've got these two and the two others, so that's four mass, and this is one half of a bond length, and that's squared. So for the horizontal, I can then take this all the way over here, 
So that's just 2m r squared. This is 4. And that 1 half squared gives me 1 fourth. So that's 1 fourth r squared. So this is 2. That's going to give me 1. So for the horizontal, my moment of inertia, I'm getting 3 masses times the bond length squared. So this one is still bigger than this one. So the last thing I would need to do is show that for this vertical axis, we're able to demonstrate that we're still going to get 3 times mr squared. So let's uh, do that. So I can draw the vertical axis here. And in this case, it captures these guys. So all I really have here is uh, here, CH, here, CH, and then back here. And so the thing I need to do now is recognize I'm going to have four, because I've got these two as well as these two mirrored on the other side. And I need to figure out what this length is. Right? So if that's the right angle, because this cut in half, this has to be a 60, which means that this one in here is a 30 degree angle. And now we can use some trigonometry to figure all of that out. So I'm going to have four of these mass, and I'm going to have the bond length, but what I'm multiplying by is going to be the cosine of 30. So that's cosine 30 times the bond length, and that has to be squared. So now we have to kind of reach all the way back into our math knowledge for what the value of cosine of 30 is. And so that's 4 times the mass. So cosine of 30 ends up being square root of 3 over 2. And um, this one bond, that's all squared. So now if I square this, I'm going to get 3 over 4. So 4 times 3 over 4 times the mass times that one bond squared. So the 4 is canceled, and I'm left with 3 times the mass times the bond squared. So let me write that again over here. We have 3 mass and the bond squared. So we can now see that this fits the criteria for being oblate because we have a unique moment of inertia that is larger than two identical moments of inertia. And all it took to figure that out was the application of a little bit of trigonometry and a little bit of thinking about the symmetry of the molecule and how we place our axes in three-dimensional space.